Hello, and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, uh, the series where I show you some photos and then radically go on to tell you about them. This is episode six, um, and as I was figuring out what to talk about in this film, I realised shamefully that in all the previous films, I never mentioned any British photographers at all. I'd only ever talked about Americans like uh, Louis Fora, Diane Arbus, Joel Sternfeld, uh, and even Mark Rebu. So this week, I thought I'd try and right that terrible wrong by presenting you with a comprehensive overview of British photography of the last 200 years or so. So from 1836 right up until the present day, sort of. And I'm going to do the whole thing as a wrap. No, I'm not. Actually, I thought about it, but then I realised that that would be an absolutely terrible idea and the worst thing ever. Uh, but I am going to try and cover all that period of time. Um, as you'll notice, there are huge gaps in my chronology. It's by no intent means intended to be fully comprehensive. Uh, it's a very, very subjective overview. But let's give it a go anyway and see what happens. And maybe if this goes down well, I'll do a part two or a part three and I'll do them as a wrap. Anyway, let's get cracking because there's a shitload to get through. So the first possibly contentious statement to make is that the British invented photography. Now, this is a very controversial subject. People have spent years and years investigating, researching and arguing the toss. But the undisputable fact is that this is the oldest existing camera negative. It's from 1835 or 1836. No one is exactly clear. A bit like the picture itself. I know, I know, it isn't great but it is an important historical document. Actually, that was the positive printed from the negative, and it was taken by this man, William Henry Fox Talbot, and it's of some windows in his house, Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire. It was produced by a process that involved salting paper in order to fix the images, and Fox Talbot went on to refine and later develop this into another process called the calotype, which drastically reduced exposure times. Now, we're in extreme danger of wanging on about chemicals and techniques and methods for far too long here, and there really isn't time for all of that. What we do need to acknowledge, though, are two indisputable facts. First fact is that William Henry Fox Talbot, the British father of photography, was a very, very bald man indeed. Uh, in that photograph I showed you earlier, he was hiding his condition under a giant stovepipe hat. But here he is, without that hat, in a photograph taken by John Moffat in 1864. And you can see that this is from the front, and he's got a few strands that he's half attempted to muster into a comb over. But then, in this photo, which I presume predates that one, and might even be a self-portrait, he's gone for a profile shot in order to disguise the full extent of his baldness. And you can see the point from where all those ultimately futile comb-over strands originate. This is an old, much-used baldy trick. But joking aside, it does make this image an equally important historical document in itself, as I would argue that this photograph here is the oldest photographic record of man's innate vanity. The very first ever comb-over photo. And it's British. Huzzah! The second important fact to confront is that William Henry Fox Talbot was posh. In fact, he was very, very posh indeed. His house, Laycock Abbey, dates from the 14th century. His mother was Lady Elizabeth Fox Strangways, daughter of the second Earl of Ilchester. William Henry went to Harrow School and then to Cambridge University, and then he became a Member of Parliament. Now, you may say, why does all this matter? Why is his background at all relevant? Well, as I hope to explain, um, you'll see that the class system in Britain is absolutely central to the development of British photography and the role that that had to play in it. Uh, it's impossible to talk about one thing without mentioning and acknowledging the other. I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> I am middle class. <laughs> I know my place. <laughs> Photography in the UK started off as something that was the exclusive domain of the educated aristocracy, the upper class. And for a while, they used it to examine their own surroundings, their country houses and their mates. Uh, and then after a while, as we'll go on to see, they turned that lens on their inferiors, on the working classes. 
but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because um, what we should really do is go and consider the other father of photography, the very French, and it has to be said, very impressively coiffured Louis Daguerre. Here he is with a fulsome set of locks in around 1844. Daguerre was the inventor of the daguerreotype, which used a silver plated copper negative as opposed to Fox Talbot's paper process. It's also worth bearing in mind that uh, Daguerre came from a far more modest background, which may or may not have something to do with the fact that France had beheaded a large section of its own aristocracy less than 50 years earlier. Now that's not just me being flippant for once, there's a valid point here, which is while Fox Talbot's first photograph was of the lattice windows of his 14th century ancestral home, this is one of the earliest daguerreotypes, and it's a street scene which is thought to be the first ever photographic image that includes a human being. Actually, it's two human beings. There's a bloke having his shoes shine there in the bottom left corner. So it's a street photograph, and it's of everyday life. It's an image which engages with the outside world. It's not just a bunch of rich toffs photographing their manners or their mates or beauty spots, which they also probably owned. Because for a number of years after the invention of photography, it seemed, within Britain certainly, that there was very much a set of subjects that were considered proper to photograph. And those were the Gentile and higher things mainly nature and other aristocrats. Fox Talbot invented his own process in the first place because he was frustrated with his own artistic shortcomings. Apparently, when he was on his honeymoon, his etchings of Lake Como in Italy kept on coming out a bit shonky, as you can see from one of them here. Honest. So he set about devising a better way to capture nature. In fact, he first called his process the pencil of nature. And many of his later successful photos are exquisite shots of his stately home, or Oxford College, or trees. They are refined, and already way back then, they begin to present and define a certain image of Britain and Englishness. And what could be more British than the royal family, despite the fact that they're actually German? Now, I am absolutely no monarchist, but I also begrudgingly have to acknowledge that it is impossible to talk about the history of British photography without the royals creeping in or just invading. Let me explain. Photography is a Victorian invention. Victoria came to the throne in 1837, at almost exactly the same time as its invention. And she's the first ever monarch to be photographed, although it's worth pointing out that when um, William Edward Kilburn came to photograph Queen Victoria and her five children in 1852, she was so upset with the final image in which her eyes seemed to be closed due to the long duration of the exposure that she scratched her own face off the derogotype, pronounced it horrid, and had the poor photographer publicly flogged and imprisoned in the Tower of London. That last detail might be untrue. Early tantrums at shitty portraits aside, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert grew to love uh, photography. They became uh, early adopters, if you will, uh, and their patronage and enthusiasm helped to um, launch photography on the British public. They amassed their own collection of 20,000 or so images and uh, they helped launch the career of many British photographers. And in 1860, they gave permission to the photographer J.J. Mayle to photograph them together and then release the image for sale as what was known as a carte de visite, basically a small postcard that could be mass reproduced and sold in the shops. This was the first time that members of the general public could waste their hard-earned wages on buying an exact likeness of their own sovereign. So it was hugely significant and gave photography a massive boost. Astonishingly, by 1861, over 300 million carte de visites were being sold in the UK alone. And when Prince Albert died unexpectedly of typhoid that year, in 1861, uh, Queen Victoria gave permission to have his body photographed. So there he is, dead. The photograph was taken by William Bambridge, which started a trend for death photos. And later, Bambridge and other photographers were given permission to photograph the Queen in her trademark black mourning clothes, which helped create a carefully constructed image of the monarch that endures to this day. But enough of the royals, for now. Because although it would be possible to endlessly honk on about toffs, or allow ourselves to be seduced by the beautiful, soft focus, whimsical portraits of notable Victorians, often with huge beards, or wings, or golden locks, that were taken by Julia Margaret Cameron, this one's astonishingly titled, Maud, there has fallen a splendid tear from the passion flower at the gate. I'd much rather take a look at some images of real life from that period, uh, because that's what street photography is meant to be about, isn't it? Real life and real people. The 99.9%, .9%, not just the 0.1% at the very top. But the best British photographs I know of from that period don't start to exist until around the 1890s. 
and shockingly or maybe uh, necessarily they come from a photographer who was born abroad who was born in France of all places incroyable uh, Paul Martin or maybe that should be Paul Martin was born in Alsace-Lorraine in 1864 but his family uh, fled to the UK in 1872 to uh, escape the Franco-Prussian War Martin grew up going back and forth between the UK and France and eventually settled in London where he worked as a woodblock engraver on Fleet Street in the 1880s. This is the only photo I can find of him. I hope it's him anyway. And you can see he's got a great head of hair and he was very much a normal working person, not a toff poncing about on their country estate. Uh, Martin became uh, obsessed and entranced with photography, but he wasn't interested in going out and photographing nature. He was interested in the real life that he saw around him. And in 1898, crucially, he bought a camera that was known as the Fallowfield Facile Detective Camera, which was a relatively portable lightweight box and could be disguised as a parcel wrapped up in brown paper. You'd shoot it handheld without a tripod from waist level and so it was perfect for a street photographer. And that's what Martin was, a really good early street photographer. He'd uh, go out uh, on his lunch break to Fleet Street and Hoburn, take his portable camera with him disguised as a parcel and take photos of what he found there. And uh, these are a selection of them. There's this amazing one of a woman being rescued from a coach crash, a boy drinking lemonade, porters at a market, and even a poor dancing bear. Martin said of his work that it is impossible to describe the thrill which taking the first snaps without being noticed gave one, but also that when he showed his images that he'd taken of everyday life uh, to some of his fellow camera club members, they were shocked or even outraged by what they saw because they felt a plate demanded a noble and dignified subject, a cathedral or mountain or family party dressed up in their Sunday best. Martin's work is so great and valuable precisely because that's what it wasn't. In fact, he even took his hidden camera to the seaside and thereby started a long tradition of candid photography of Brits at the beach, many of whom weren't dressed up at all, but stripped off wearing comparatively nothing. These types of images would become a quintessential cornerstone of British street photography to be expanded upon and developed in subsequent years by photographers like Tony Ray Jones, Chris Dill Perkins, and of course, Martin Parr. And I know I've always promised that uh, show and tell wouldn't become a series where I endlessly bang on about gear, but why oh why can't any modern camera manufacturer see the market for making a camera that you can disguise in a pizza box or even a, a fried chicken box like this? Um, so this Leica, if you're watching, could be the Leica Barber Q. Get it? Uh, so you'd have your camera in there, you cut a little hole there, and then you could go out and about pretending to be eating your, your um, chips or your chicken and all the time snapping away. Uh, it would be fantastic. Leica, give me a call. We can clean up, honestly. Anyway, so by the turn of the century, uh, by the start of the 1900s, there were two very distinct branches of British photography. The genteel and refined architecture, nature and aristocratic branch and the more down at heel everyday life of snappers such as Paul Martin. But then came the First World War, which literally blew all the established norm to bits. Now, it would be perfectly possible to do an entire film on World War I photography and, you know, maybe sometime in the future I will do, but at the moment there isn't time. But what I think it is worth reflecting on briefly is the fact, is another technological innovation, um, which is that by the time the First World War came about, uh, cameras had got a lot, lot smaller. And that meant that soldiers didn't have to disguise their own cameras as parcels when they went to the front. They could take something far more pocketable. They were the relatively tiny VPKs, the Vest Pocket Kodak or Soldier's Kodak. So uh, this one is uh, actually my grandfather's camera. Uh, it's not uh, from the same era, it's a little bit later, but it, the design and the model is exactly the same. So it would open up like that and it's a bellows and you can see quite how tiny and pocketable, I mean, it's like the equivalent of a modern day smartphone, a bit thicker, but uh, it's, it's a fantastically portable, lightweight camera. And what that meant was that soldiers could take it out onto the front and it would allow them to record exactly what life was like in the trenches. The camera only cost about £1.50 and it took 127 roll film. However, the higher-ups soon realised that allowing the rank and file to expose and reveal the realities of war could have a very bad effect on morale. And so early on in the conflict, they banned soldiers from having their own cameras. 
and they tried to put out just strictly regulated, uh, controlled images, propaganda, basically, which seemed to suggest officers just lounged around listening to music with their dogs or carrying their dogs across fields. But this was an abject failure. The soldiers ignored the orders and continued snapping away. Not only that, but newspapers offered cash incentives. The Daily Mirror promised huge cash prizes for real war photographs. A thousand quid is a lot of money in those days. Which is possibly how today we have these stunning photographs taken on Christmas Day in 1914 as British and German troops stopped fighting on the Western Front and came up out of the trenches into no man's land to exchange food, tobacco and drink and briefly stopped blowing each other to smithereens. Some of these photos were taken by Captain John Stansfeld of the 2nd Battalion Gordon Highlanders. World War I ended in 1918 and at this point we're just going to stop and take another very brief royal family interlude or detour. Uh, first of all we're going to consider this shocking photograph from 1920 taken at the Epsom Derby. I don't know who it's by but it shows King George V and his entourage riding along in a carriage and totally ignoring what is often labelled as a beggar or sometimes even a gypsy running alongside. However on closer inspection it becomes clear that this man is actually a soldier an unemployed former soldier, as you can see by the medals on his chest. So here we have a man who presumably just two years ago would have been fighting for king and country in the trenches, and now here he is reduced to running alongside the king's carriage with his cap out. Today, this is the sort of thing that would happen to Prince Andrew and be labelled a PR disaster. And now let's briefly move on to this other photo, also anonymous. It's a press photo that featured in the evening news of the 11th of December 1936 and it shows Edward VIII just minutes after he had formally abdicated due to his relationship with the twice-divorced American Mrs. Wallace Simpson. And it's an absolutely classic paparazzi-type photo through the window of a moving car. What both these images clearly show is that how, by the 1930s, uh, photography in Britain had grown impossible to control. The royals can't just scratch out an image they don't like anymore. They can't manipulate it. They can't exert too much influence over it. And that's important although it hasn't subsequently stopped them owning half the country and constantly taking the piss, but uh, that's another story and let's not go there. Uh, what we do need to do is to continue to talk about some photographers in the 1930s, and uh, whilst there are lots of others that we could focus on, uh, there's one that we simply can't ignore, and that's Bill Brandt. Now, Brand was not only a fantastic photographer, but he was also a fascinating and complicated man. And it would be criminal just to look at his photographs without also considering uh, his sense of identity and what he meant to our own collective sense of identity and being English. Because more than any other photographer, that's what Brand is responsible for. He's responsible for how we see ourselves. And that's uh, fascinating because when you discover he wasn't born in South London, as he always claimed and got quite angry if anyone dared to counter him, he was actually born in Hamburg in Germany in 1904. His father, Ludwig, was English, but only by birth. But his mother and both sets of grandparents were German. Brandt's full name was actually Hermann Wilhelm Brandt, which he later shortened to Willy and then to Bill. He lived a very comfortable, cultured life all around Europe up until he was 30 years old. He got into photography in the 1920s. Here's a picture of him from that period, showing off his lovely thick head of hair. He met the American poet Ezra Pound in Vienna, who introduced him to the great American surrealist artist Man Ray, who Brand assisted for several months in Paris, learning a great deal about darkroom techniques, and then he began to develop his own distinctive style. But with the rise of the Nazis, Brand and his first wife, Eva Boros, moved to the UK in 1934 and settled in Belsize Park in North London. And here's the really amazing thing. Within just two years of moving to the UK, Brand had published his first book. It was called The English at Home, and it's an absolutely brilliant portrait of British society at the time. There are a couple of factors that distinguish this book and set it apart. The first is that what starts off as a seemingly typical, almost cliched look at London, the opening photo is of this seagull just called Fog Over London's River. And initially you think that Brand is going to let his camera just fly over the city, taking in the usual touristy sights. So the next photo is of a palace guard and then a bobby on patrol, it could almost be a picture post illustrated story on London society. And Brand did go on to work for both the Picture Post and Lilliput magazines for the next 20 years. But then, after a few more photos of high up aristocratic London, something truly interesting starts to happen. First of all, we go inside one of the expensive London houses and we see the domestic servants. Then we go back outside and see a drunken toff slouched against the lamppost. We see parties, fox hunts, 
and even sheep on Hampstead Heath. But then suddenly we go underneath the countryside to look at miners returning to daylight. Brandt's book isn't just going to stick to the picturesque cliches. He's also going to go and meet the lower classes. And the rest of the book is a series of stark juxtapositions, many taken in the slums of London's East End. Brandt got everywhere. Like Paul Martin 40 years earlier, he photographs porters at markets, this one with a huge fish on his head. He's out there engaging with life. One minute, he's at a cricket match, and then he's at a tailor's photographing the baldest head I've ever seen, and I've seen some bald heads. And then he's contrasting that bald head with all these top hats. He's in pubs and slums and at the beach. Brand goes all over the place, exposing the contrasts, contradictions and inequalities that made up Britain in the 1930s, many of which are still with us today. But the really amazing thing about lots of these photos in English at Home and in many of Brand's subsequent books is that they're not initially what they seem to be. Remember that photo of the slouched drunken toff? Well, that's not a candid street photo. That's actually Brand's brother Ralph posing for the camera. Just like in this photo too, that's Ralph again on the taxi's running board. Many of Brandt's classic photos that purport to, or at least seem to be candid, are in fact carefully staged. Remember the maids in Dinner is Served? Well, that maid on the left was called Pratt, and she was in service in Brandt's uncle's house in Kensington. Brandt's social class and connections gave him access to the upper echelons of British society, and his confidence and artistic ambition allowed him to then go down a coal mine or into an East End slum to get the shot he wanted. Here he is posing his sister-in-law, Esther, on a Brighton beach. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was very harsh on another photographer who also stages his photos, uh, Greg Zapp Crudson. So why am I being a lot more forgiving with Hermann Wilhelm Brandt? Well, first of all, I think he's a better photographer with more to say. His photographs arise out of what I think is a genuine desire, an almost fervent desire, to assimilate into his new home and his new country and to understand it. The fact that he always continued to insist he was born in South London shows he was really traumatised and ashamed of his German origins. Maybe he never got over the fact that his father dressed him and his brothers up as little German soldiers when World War I broke out, especially as his father was later thrown into a German internment camp for six months due to his being born in Britain. After the rise of Hitler, Brandt not only rejected Germany, but he then set out and set himself the task of recording the whole of Britain and what it meant to be English. He set out a template, uh, which we're still referring to these days, and he did it not with a huge crew, but with his family and whoever happened to be around. He carried his own camera, and that to me is very important. But crucially, Brandt's images aren't a complete fiction. They are very much born out of real life. He always shot people in their genuine surroundings. This is what Britain looked like. These are real people. It's just that sometimes he moves them about a bit to make his point better. And not all of them are setups. This one isn't, nor is this one. He combines the candid with the posed, but puts them all under the veil of his artistic vision. And by sheer force of will, he created an enduring portrait of an entire country. Brandt was never blinkered or myopic in his vision. Uh, and he was also very affected by the writings and the books of George Orwell. And Orwell has uh, some fascinating parallels with Brand. He was also born abroad, in this case in Bengal. His family came back to England and he was sent to Eton. Uh, he also changed his name. Uh, in this case, though, he went the whole hog. Uh, he changed his name from uh, Eric Blair to George Orwell. So he too was acutely aware of class divisions and how class ruled everything in England. Orwell wrote that, England is the most class-ridden country under the sun. It is a land of snobbery and privilege, ruled largely by the old and the silly. And after reading The Road to Wigan Pier, which was published in 1937 and sees Orwell visit various industrial mining towns up and down the country, Brand decided that he too was going to go out and make an exploration. And so he took his camera to Halifax and produced these stunning, unforgettable photographs of the different world he found there. As a brief aside, it's also informative to uh, see how frequently Brand's photographs have been used by book designers. This is one he took called Coal Searcher Going Home to Jarrow in 1937. And here's the cover of the 1958 American edition of Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier, which is clearly a complete ripoff of that photo. Or here's the Penguin Classics 1989 edition of Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London. And you can see they've simply used Brand's 1935 photo behind the restaurant and simply flipped the image. Or well, these two classic Brandt photos, which were both used as covers for the books of Patrick Hamilton, the great doomed writer of London in the 1930s and 40s. And if you haven't read The Slaves of Solitude or Hangover Square yet, then shame on you. Go and read them both now, or maybe after this.
it's almost impossible to think of that time in Britain's history without conjuring up Brand's images. He's iconic. His camera has crafted and created an entire collective consciousness, whether that's one of privilege or deprivation, coal miners' houses or boozy nights in pubs. Brand has been there and taken the photos. And despite his fabrication or collusion in some of their origins, they feel honest and heartfelt. He understood how the carefully constructed image could lodge in the mind and supplant actuality. Like John Cocteau wrote, history is a combination of reality and lies. The reality of history becomes a lie. The unreality of the fable becomes truth. Brandt's power was such that when World War II broke out, he was one of the photographers commissioned by the Ministry of Information to take photographs of the Blitz, uh, which is astonishing when you consider that he was German. And here was a situation that he couldn't fake or set up. He was working by moonlight in the wreckage of London or in the underground and the crypts of churches where plucky Londoners, apparently, even took shelter in empty coffins and his photographs were sent to Washington as part of the British government's drive to get the Americans to join the war against Hitler. Photography as evidence, as propaganda and national identity. Photographs taken by a German photographer who had reinvented himself as an English gent. Now, I could keep honking on about Bill Brandt for hours and hours, but there really isn't time. However, I do want to squeeze in just one more photographer who I think is worthy of our consideration because they really do give an insight into uh, English society and Britishness. Um, like Orwell from earlier on and Brandt and even Paul Martin to a lesser extent, they have a complicated relationship with this country. They have foreign roots, uh, but they are very much part of British society. In fact, uh, this person is at the absolute upper echelons of English society. You can't get any higher. Who is this photographer, I hear you ask? Well, it's Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Elizabeth Windsor, or to give her her full original family name, Elizabeth Sachs Coburg Gotha. Now, here's the thing. Elizabeth was always taking photos. Unlike Queen Victoria, who never took a photograph in her life, throughout Queen Elizabeth's incredibly long reign, you can always find photographs of her snapping away either with the latest Leica, or her gold Rolleiflex, or a TLR, or many of the other cameras she no doubt got gifted for free. She was also partial to the crafty hip shot, and here's even a photo of her using a predecessor to my brilliant concealed camera fried chicken box idea, the Leica barbecue. But astonishingly, no one has ever seen any of her photos. They've never been exhibited or published. Uh, we don't even know who developed them for her. Did she take them off to Snappy Snaps? We just don't know. She didn't have a Flickr account or an Instagram feed. Uh, we have no idea whether she was a great photographer or a rubbish one. And I find this idea fascinating. Um, she puts me in mind of another female photographer, another enigma with foreign roots, who then produced a huge body of work in her adopted country that remained unseen throughout her lifetime. By now, the story of Vivian Mayer is incredibly well known, and I'm not going to attempt to repeat it all here. But the great coincidence that struck me when I was making this film is that both Vivian Mayer and Elizabeth Windsor were born in exactly the same year, 1926, just two months apart, although the similarities end there. Mayer spent much of her life in service and spent all her earnings on photography. No one gave her free cameras and film, but it got me thinking, what if, when Prince Charles gets crowned next May and finally moves into the palaces, he's going to want to do a bit of tidying up, isn't he? They must be chock full of crap that his parents had amassed over the decades, and what if he chucks out rolls and rolls of undeveloped film? And what if someone finds them in a skip and develops them? What would they discover there? Would those images help us better understand what it means to be British? Would they give us more insight than the works of Bill Brandt or Paul Martin or any of the other photographers who have been recording life on this strange little island? I have no idea. What I do know is that one of the great joys of photography is that it's democratic and anyone can do it. Uh, one of the other great joys of it is that it's all about sharing and showing other people what you've made. Photography works by uh, exposure, by breaking down barriers and exposing things to the light. Royalty, monarchy, is based on entirely opposite principles. It's undemocratic. It claims that one tiny group of people are better than all the others and that they have the right not to reveal everything, to keep their secrets and to exclude, to keep the oiks and the proles outside the gates. Are the Queen's photos any good? I have no idea. I doubt it. They're probably rubbish, but I'd like to know. I'd like to be given the chance to find out, although I seriously doubt I ever will be. Uh, my name's Stephen Leslie, and this has been Show and Tell. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments down below. 
and I'll try to do another one uh, quite soon and maybe sometime in the future I'll do a part two or a part three about British photography as a wrap. Or maybe not. Anyway, thanks for watching uh, and see you again soon.